Hi everyone, this is Evie Lupine. Welcome back. And today I have a very special guest with us. This is Lee Harrington, a longtime BDSM participant, educator, and author. Writer of some of my favorite books in BDSM. If you guys have been on really <laughs> any of the places where I give recommendations for books, probably at least three or four of his are on that list. Um, they've been very instrumental in actually forming my own ethos about kink, if you will, and I'm so excited to have him on. And today, what we're going to be discussing is spirituality and BDSM. But uh, before we get into that particular topic today, um, I did want to first give Lee a chance to introduce himself, uh, just because I know some of you guys may not be as familiar with Lee as I am. So if you want to tell us a little bit about yourself, how long you've been in the scene for, how long you've been educating for, that would be great. Absolutely. And thank you so much for having me on the show, Evie. I really appreciate it. I have been part of the public BDSM and kink communities for a little over 20 years now. And I look back and go, wow, where did the time go? Uh, when I came first came into the scene, it was still, you know, we I, I joke with uh, Melina Williams that it was back in the days when foreplay sounded like eh, 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 uh, of trying to load up the BDS, <laughs> right? Um, and it's been quite the adventure along the way. I've written seven, eight books, something like that, and edited a couple of others as an uh, anthology editor and been part of a number of others because I'm a big believer that every single person who explores sexuality has something they can offer to other people, whether it's one-on-one -on -one mentorship or whether it's teaching classes or writing or blogging or just offering reflections and friendships for folks. I, I'm a big believer in that. And along the way, I have been, I, I'm transgender. And so along the way, I've been really honored to be a mistress. I've been a master. I have served as a 24-7 slave and uh, been a human puppy. And right now I'm living in Anchorage, Alaska. And uh, with my partner and our big fluffy black dog named Chico, <laughs> and really just enjoying an opportunity to continue creating friendships and bonds in this amazingly diverse community. I think that's really the goal for everyone. I mean, maybe not necessarily having a big fluffy dog, but just getting the <laughs> opportunity to get out there in the scene and, and really explore and you should just try out so many different things because you've really been all over the place. You've really seen a, a lot of different things, played a lot of different roles, had a lot of different hats on, as it were. Um, to get started in this particular conversation, um, the reason why I wanted to talk about this is I did a podcast with a couple of my other kinky friends uh, a couple of weeks ago. We talked about religious play. And as we got more and more into the topic, I realized just how much room there was still left to cover in that and how wide of a topic that even is, which is not something I, I typically see discussed, at least in, in my spheres. And that could just be a bias of, of my age and the location of where I live because I live in a, a particularly uh, atheist bent part of the world. Uh, but I, I really wanted to be able to continue that conversation and, and said, shed some more light on spirituality and BDSM, how those two things interact, how people use it, how they come to the place where they incorporate their religious or spiritual identity with their BDSM identity. Um, so would you be willing to maybe offer a little bit of background on where you come from and your story uh, with how you interact with spirituality in, in your BDSM in a general way? Yeah. So when uh, I was younger, my parents, my mother was a goddess worshiper. Lutheran and my father was a born again Catholic. And so I, I was really blessed that since they couldn't agree on how to raise me, I got a chance to explore with absolutely everything under the sun. I danced naked in groves and I got to dance with snakes and go to mosque and temple and, and have a lot of experiences. And when I got involved with kink, I had this realization that the altered states of consciousness that I was reaching and this moment of touching something ephemeral beyond the thing called me kept on happening mm -hmm. both when I was in moments of prayer or transcendental spiritual experiences, as well as when I was being flogged or really good sex, right? Like these things kept having a, a similarity for me. And I, I started having conversations with people and really finding that this was a thing that was coming up for a lot of people. And for some folks who you, you mentioned the idea of uh, atheist bent 
kinksters and sexual explorers, for some people, using words of spirituality or sacred experiences were a turnoff, not just sexually a mm. turnoff, but emotionally a turnoff. Because there are some, for some folks, they've been really scarred by their upbringing of what their spiritual experience looked like in their youth. Or for others, it's almost a cognitive dissonance, a confusion around how this could be a spiritual or emotionally or sacredly intimate experience. Now, I, I hmm. break down this notion of what some people call spiritual sexuality or whatnot into a couple different categories. One for me is the idea of offering your sexuality as a sacred offering. I know a number mm. of pagans and folks who are tantricas and tantra practitioners for whom their sexuality is an offering over to a greater divinity or to a, a sense of spirit beyond themselves. It's a, it's mm -hmm. a prayer, right? I know other mm -hmm. folks for whom it is how they touch the divine and or the liminal. It's, it's how they get in touch with this thing, whether you call it spirituality or not. It's how they feel bigger, something bigger than themselves if you look at it from an Alcoholics Anonymous framework. Right? Mm -hmm. That is bigger mm -hmm. than you. I know other people for whom, though, the third one is this idea that it's spirituality, sexy spirituality fetishism. Right, people who I know that are uh, that enjoy Satanist role playing rather than being Satanists themselves, where it's like, yeah, this is dark and spirit, sexy and spooky. And for some folks I know that um, had a really traumatic spiritual experience younger on, there is something really hot and kind of sexy broken about taking those things and flipping them on their ear and doing something profane. And so it's really about intent and where you're coming from, because I know for some people it's about, oh my, like, I, for example, I went to a play party uh, in Portland, Oregon years ago, and it was at an old temple space for the Mormon church. Oh, I love it. They did a, there was a couple that did a piss play scene in the Baptist. <laughs> Oh my God. I love it. That's awesome. And so for me as somebody who has Mormon friends, I had these moments where I was like, okay, I'm feeling really conflicted. Because at one hand, I was like, oh, that's so hot and reclaiming and really enjoying the body positivity and bliss of your own personal journey. And on the other hand, I'm like, that's somebody's sacred thing that you're def – and it was a really interesting journey inside my own body because one of the things about being an adult is that you can have two emotions at the same time. Mm -hmm. And I was having that moment of having two very different experiences. So that's a lot of information. But to me, it really breaks down into three different categories. Yeah, I think that's a great place to start out at. Because I know for me, when I was kind of conceptualizing this conversation, I was definitely kind of going along that same train of thought of I know everybody has sort of has a different place and a different energy that they're either wanting to bring into scenes that incorporate this wanting a way to incorporate it into their dynamics or even possible feelings that it brings up just as an onlooker and one of the points that you mentioned specifically was the story of the Mormon temple where somebody's doing a piss play scene um and because there is that possibility where some people are going to witness that and they're going to have those conflicted emotions. Um, one, I, I would ask, would you consider that type of spiritual play to be edge play? And two, um, if you are wanting to engage in this type of play, how do you go about it in an ethical way? So let's say you have somebody who's interested in, in doing something along, along the lines of, say, of say uh, you know, something that's uh, Shinto, something that's Buddhist, something that's incorporating maybe elements of religions that they are not personally a part of without necessarily being offensive to people around them who may have that spiritual identity as part of uh, who they are in a very core way. Yeah, but I, I think that I love that you say that isn't necessarily their identity. Because there are mm -hmm. people, I, I was teaching down in New Orleans, and I had a couple who came up after my sacred kink class who were devout Christians, who were saying that they were getting Christian shamed in the kink community because people were saying, well, you can't be Christian and kinky. And they're like, we go to, we go to the play parties on Saturday, and we're always up for church at 9.30 a.m. on Sundays. And we're here as a married couple, enjoying the bodies that God gave us. And for them, they were like, no, we're incredible incorporating these things into our life because it is who we are. Mm -hmm. And that's very different than um, 
being at International Ms. Leather, and there was a scene that happened for one of the performances on stage where it was a dyke, or I don't know how they self-identify actually, but a woman who plays with women or somebody who was assigned female at birth who plays with women that was dressed as a priest. And there ended up being this orgy and takedown scene between all of the parishioners while the priest was beating somebody with a Bible. (laughs) <laughs> those are two very different takes on Christianity yeah. and kink. Uh, and, and I don't personally believe that either is better or worse with the acknowledgement, though, that if these are a fetish thing for you and a fun thing to play with, to know that there might be people in the room for whom this is part of their identity. Mm-hmm. There's this notion of where is respect in a community. And and for me, if a if a party is big enough, or a space is big enough where people can leave a room, right? Where they can go somewhere else. I, I go to kinky campouts every year. And if you could go to a different end of the campground where you don't have to hear it, fine. Get your freaky, kinky, spiritual fetishism stuff going on. But if there's only one space, and there's especially if there's a likelihood that somebody in the room who ha- has that as part of their journey, I don't personally find that respectful unless you check with the other people who attend that party on a regular basis that it's okay or the party hosts because they'll know their audience. Yeah. I, I have – there's an interesting thing that comes up with consent in the scene that people talk a lot about consenting with yourself. Like, do I agree to this experience I'm about to have? And mm-hmm. consent with a partner. Does my partner ex- agree ahead of time and in this moment that we're cool with what they're doing? But where is the place of consent for the voyeur or the person who is in the space? It could be argued by some people, well, that they're in the room. So really you consented to whatever you saw and it's up to you to leave the space. That's one take on it. And it's a valid take. There's another take on it, though, that says that we are playing. We need to play well with each other to create a collaborative community. And if we're doing that, that requires understanding that it's not appropriate for everyone. There's a play party in New York that I love. They have an edge play room. Scenes that they Mm. know that are likely to hit people's buttons. Uh, So anything that involves a weapon or role playing that has anything that looks like domestic abuse. They Mm. always have those scenes take place in a specific room. And if you know the general topic of your scene, you put it up on the the sign-up sheet when you're about to go in so people can consent before they walk into that room of what they're about to see. And I think- That's great. Yeah, I thought it was a really creative idea. And for some people, uh, religious topics and spiritual topics um, can be hot and fun, but can also- So it's like, where is your place around the notion of consent is pretty much what I'm thinking. Yeah. And I I know, especially when it does come to things with- religion, politics, anything that is sort of maybe part of somebody's vanilla life that can be very real, they don't necessarily want to see in their kink spaces. They're like, no, no, I I go away to (laughs) escape from this. I don't want to have political play. I don't want to have to worry about the fact that I'm trying to parse my religious identity with my, you know, identity as a kinkster and if those two things fit together. Um, And I thought that was really great. You brought up the Christian couple who was at uh, the talk about spirituality and BDSM and feeling like they were being shamed for being Christians. And in, in my experience, the people that I I have met who incorporate their spiritual practices into their kink do tend to be pagan or practice magic or Satanist or something along sort of, let's say, the uh, non-monotheistic religions. Um, and I find that really interesting, but as well... I wonder if, uh, I don't know exactly how to phrase this, but is there really any conflict directly between people who are, are, are pagan or who are practicing their beliefs through BDSM, people who are Christian and trying to do the same, or is it more just sort of maybe a subliminal feeling of, I don't really feel like I belong here. I don't feel like I mesh with these other people. So faith is a very profoundly intimate experience. When I talk to folks at a church or a synagogue or a mosque, or whether I'm talking to people at a grove or a fairy gathering uh, or a a moot, everybody's take on their experience with how they intertwine with divinity and how they see it and experience it, it's different for every person. Even if everybody is reading the same exact holy book, right, or listening to the exact same Mm -hmm. prayers – you're going to have a different feeling and experience of it. I have I see this a lot with the discussion right now in queer communities around Islamic queer youth. 
right? Where people say, ah, oh, like, well, that's mm-hmm. not possible. And there are Islamic queer youth who are like, actually, I am both Islamic. I am Islamic and queer. Don't tell me that I'm not. I exist. I exist. Don't yeah. tell me that I don't <laughs> exist. I know I'm standing right here. Um, mm-hmm. So I have met uh, Raven Caldera, actually, rewind a little bit. Raven Caldera argues that there's this concept of the axes of non-normalcy. That once you are mm. in a community that the overculture says is weird, right, that suddenly the, the crossover lines of what you're willing to tolerate and or willing to interact with or be part of start crossing over pretty fast. So, for example, I know a lot of science fiction nerds that also happen mm. to be polyamorous. And I know a lot of polyamorous people who might happen to be kinky. And I know a lot of kinky people who happen to be pagan. And I happen to know a lot of kinky, pagan, polyamorous sci-fi nerds. Mm-hmm. A lot of them. Because <laughs> Yeah, there's, I'm thinking like, that's about everybody I know. <laughs> right. They start crossing um, over pretty fast because there's this idea of bonding in the face of overculture that says we are wrong, be, weird, or bad in some way. And as overculture shifts over time, what was acceptable or normal, when we look at gay marriage, what is acceptable, normal, or at least able to operate in an overculture keeps on shifting. Right now in the kink community, uh, there's a big conversation around which parts are we mirroring of overculture and what's healthy and what's not. The racism that's Mm. being brought into the scene consciously and unconsciously, right? Uh, Mm -hmm. The uh, homophobia. Right. There's all these things that pe- people in the kink community may not be aware of these these traumas of their overculture that they're bringing into it. And so for mm-hmm. me, when I look at this notion of is it going against what you believe in? I know people uh, who are Sufi uh, in the kink community. I know people who are Muslim. I know people who are Buddhist. I know people who are practicing Quakers. I know folks who are Shinto and Norse traditions slash Asatru. I know people who are Druids, general pagans, fairy practitioners. I know Mormon kinksters. Uh, I know a lot of Catholic kinksters, Jewish kinksters. Oh, yeah. I'm raising my hand right now. I was born and raised Catholic. Right. Including, including currently practicing, because I know people who say, well, I'm a recovering mm-hmm. Catholic. If that's how you perceive <laughs> your faith, go you and your faith journey. Mm-hmm. But also know that there are people in the kink community who are still practicing their faith of upbringing. And, and I think it's a really careful thing to tread when we start faith shaming in our world. Uh, it's the same thing, in my opinion, as kink shaming. Reed Mahalko from readaboutsex.com argues that we should not yuck other people's yums, mm-hmm. which to me is a really great mantra where it's just like, you get your freaky on by being an adult baby, go you. I'm Whether mm-hmm. I'm into it or not, I'm really happy that you're happy. That's awesome. And if somebody is being really deeply inspired to be connected and whole, through their spiritual practice, and it harms no others, it does not destroy others within the kink community, get your joy on. I'm all for that. My own personal ethics, mores, and lines say that if you are coming in with your faith practice and ripping down others, both of their own, you know, if you are the one who is yucking other people's yums, as it were, then a dialogue needs to take place around whether that individual is a good fit for this specific community. I was in New York City and uh, I did a piss play class and this guy in the back of the room was a Hasidic Jew and like full curls, full hat, full outfit. And at first I was like, oh, is that his fetish wear? Because there are people who show up in various religious regalia as fetish wear. Um, And I found out later talking to him that no, no, he actually was Hasid. And uh, that he asked if I would pee on him. And I was like, wow, I'm really complimented, but no, thank you. I'm not really interested right now. And he was like, well, it's not against my faith. And I'm like, well, I'm glad to know that. I'm glad you're happy. I just don't want to play with you right now. (laughs) I I wasn't trying to yuck his faith, but there was a story for him that he had to explain how his faith interacted with his kink. Because there's a story for a lot of people that people of devout faith can't be embodied sexual beings. But in classic, in classic Judaism, yeah. if we look at it, 
God says that we have been given this amazing body, and it's one of the few ways in orthodoxy that women are allowed to divorce men if they do not provide them with a healthy sexual experience and ability to procreate. Like, you know, mm -hmm. that's pretty clear in your doctrine. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, God. This is not necessarily directly related to the topic, but over uh, Christmas vacation, I was with my family and my sister and I stayed up really late at night one night just watching TV on Christmas Eve. And we found this show called Yid Life Crisis, which is literally two um, not quite middle aged, probably like late 30s, devoutly Jewish Yiddish men talking about controversial topics within Judaism. How do you deal with sex? How do you deal with masturbation? And if, if any Jewish people that are practicing their faith are listening to this and wondering, how do I parse my sexuality with Judaism? Maybe go ahead and check that out because, you know, might be helpful. And it's That's interesting awesome. anyways. I love that. And it's been really nice to see with groups like FetLife, but even before that, seeing um, practitioners of specific faiths support each other in their sexual journeys. There's a couple of um, kink events that I've gone to over the years that have had um, have had uh, gatherings for lighting of candles. Um, uh, oh, I am a bad person. Uh, no, I'm not a bad person. I'm just forgetting the word for lighting of candles on Fridays for people who are practicing Jews. Um, but uh, it was really beautiful Seder that had leather Seders, right? And there's been yeah. entire systems that have been written up about, there is a leather Seder full script written by Laura Antoniou that you can get from her for free. Uh, that's fantastic. Uh, at Dark Odyssey, we have an opening and closing ritual that is there for people who are various forms of practicing pagans, but also just for people who want to come and have a start and an end to your ritual and have it have a bookmark on each side. Because sometimes for me going to an event, if you go straight from getting your hot kinky freaky on back to having to take care of the kids or dealing with your taxes five minutes outside of the con, it's a little jarring as compared to having a closing ritual. And thus I've seen folks who do closing rituals at events that aren't pagan at all. They're just using a technology that, spirit ha that spiritual practices have gifted them. For example, floggings. Floggings have been, used as a, have been used as a spiritual tool and or shamanic technology for thousands of years. It is, it's a rhythmic application of a hide to the skin that creates a trance-like sensation and an extreme physical sensation combined to take you out of your day-to-day -day experience of your journey. This is old technology that we are using right now to get high. Go us! right? That's yeah. awesome. Mm -hmm. But you're going to run into other people in the dungeon who are taking that as a way of expanding their shamanic technology uses. Yeah. There's, guys, especially with, with flogging, and you realize the kind of the joke that I've been told among my friends is that you know, Catholics are the original kinksters, right? Because it was this ritualistic a prayer and the ritualistic um, flagellation and just, you know, offering up your pain and suffering to God to repent to, you know, sinners in purgatory. You gotta rewind. Lupercalia amongst the Romans? Women were chased through the cities of Rome being whipped with leeks. And we're able to therefore be able to hand and lascivious women specifically, um, <laughs> right? Naughty, hot women. We're chasing. Uh -huh. <laughs> How did you? Did, did they have a list they keep throughout the year? Well, and it's funny because this idea that women who are treated, women who are having different forms of sexual journey should be treated differently, have been used throughout time millennia, whether you look at it as the pr sexual priestesses in temples and or women who have to atone for their sins by shaving their hair and wearing a hair shirt, right? Like women who have empowered sexuality, that's what, there's a fight for feminism, that kink offers a really amazing tool for a technology that can say, I can explore my sexuality out of a story that says that it's supposed to look this way through oppressive patriarchy. How sexy is that, right? And I'm not just talking for women. Yeah, I'm oh talking gosh. for everybody, right? Break out of the story of what your sixth grade teacher taught you sex was supposed to look like. 
if they taught you, right? Mm -hmm. um, like, let's break out of these stories and kink, even if you don't get specific types of your, even if you're not enjoying specific types of activities in kink, I know people who come to the kink community, see stuff and go, wow, I'd never considered that. And it allows them to just start thinking creatively about what they want their sex like life to look like. It doesn't matter if you mirror anybody else. It's about inspiration and art, in my opinion, at least. Oh, it definitely can be. And it can also just be mindless fun for that matter as well. But yeah. <laughs> sometimes Hell your brain yeah. just needs to shut off for a little bit and not think. Yeah, right. Sometimes it's just about a hot fuck. I am pro hot fuck. Pro whatever works for you. I'm all for the asexual journey as well. Okay, so I did want to go back to something you said, <laughs> oh, probably a while ago now, but what advice would you have for people who are struggling to reconcile their personal faith with their kink practices? Is that something that is reliant on, on what your faith is or what your path in kink looks like? Or is it just something that a lot of people experience? Or do most people just kind of hop right into it with both feet and, and not really have any I issues? I wish I could remember the name, who the quote was by. But there's this notion that prayer is talking to God and meditation is shutting up and listen to see if they say anything back. And so I find some, sometimes sitting right? Using that practice from, from Buddhism of to sit and meditate, it, whether, I'm, whether a person is Buddhist or not, and this is, is an amazing tool for listening to that dark little voice in the back of your head, that little shadow self, that little spark that is part of divinity as a whole, that part of us that was star stuff, right? To listen to that joyous, shining part mm -hmm. who probably has some of that wisdom waiting for you. Uh, for other people, I know it's about going mm. back to your original holy texts and finding the pieces that say where there is joy, acceptance, and love. Bono had this entire argument about how uh, we some, a lot of um, conservative Christians have this whole fight about how how being gay is wrong. And he's like, you know what? Being gay is mentioned in the entire Bible maybe like twice or three times. Not treating homeless people with respect and feeding them is mentioned over 20 times. And so until you start feeding the homeless, why are you over citing these one or two points? And so like I really sit with going back to original holy texts, having conversations, uh, going with, with people who, with the folks who are your uh, providers, your, your, your spiritual counsel, right? I, I know a lot of people who mm -hmm. will sit down and talk with their rabbi in loose terms, maybe not explicit ones, and look at it as being what is the issue at play? Is anyone being harmed by this? Is this is your faith serving you? And are you serving your faith? And in which case, what's the issue? I know for some people in their practice, they might say, oh, my sexual experiences are reserved for my spouse that I have been married to. But if the two of us happen to also swing, there's nothing about that in the holy texts, and we're still adhering to, I'm not taking anybody above my partner. There are ways to look at these things to find the bliss that divinity, in most cases, was asking humans to embrace so that we can lead good lives. In my experience, at least, when I look at most of the holy texts, they say, be a good person, do stuff that's going to make your community better be awesome, right? And and follow the edicts and what like those are the like that's what it keeps coming back to. Be a good neighbor. And so in which case if you are trying to be true to yourself, finding those spaces to to listen, to talk with peers who are on similar journeys too is incredibly useful. fetlife.com right now has become this beautiful place where I can type in catholic and if I, you scroll through, you'll find groups that say ex-Catholic and other groups that say practicing Catholics. Read the description mm -hmm. and then look at the wisdom that's being shared by others. Other people have probably had the exact same struggle as you. You are not alone. You're really not. So those are some of my thoughts. As well, for somebody who is getting started in the community, who is interested in incorporating their spirituality as part of that, or even maybe just wants to find a spiritual group who is of the same faith as them, maybe if, even if they don't 
interact in a kinky way or, or do any sort of BDSM activities together. How would you start something like that in the real life community? Let's say you live in a small town somewhere. You're just a, the little lone pagan you think in the middle of nowhere in Oklahoma. Okay, so I gotta say, Tennessee Pagan Unity Festival. People were thinking the exact same thing. Rural Tennessee, that's not. There's not that many pagans. People started putting the word out at bookstores and putting little flyers up here and there. Pagan Unity Festival is one of the largest gatherings of pagans in the U.S. in rural Tennessee. Even if you think you're alone, you're probably not. So one amazing tool is the internet. Is to hop on your, you know, type in your city. And start scrolling through people's profiles and see if there's anybody who has things in common with you. Start dialogue and conversation. The next one is to cast your net wider, right? Let's say you're Druid, for example. Hop on FetLife.com and type in Druid. Join some groups about Druid, Druidity. And then maybe post a, a, something after you've read a couple of things saying, hey, I'm from this area. Is there anyone on this list from this area? Right? So it's going in the other direction. Sometimes I've, when I've been in certain communities, I've just showed up wearing specific pieces of my spiritual practice. I will wear a pentacle, for example, because that's part of my journey. Uh, and, uh, and or I've known people who wear their cross or who show up wearing their yarmulke at a gathering and see who has conversations with them. Visi activism through visibility, mm. right? And see how you engage with that um, and with the people in that space because uh, I'm, I'm up here in Anchorage, Alaska, and we're forming a group right now called the School of Alchemical Mysteries. And it's a crossover group where we have kink events, but we also happen to have events within the pagan and non-monotheistic traditions. And there are people who show up to both types of our events and people who show up to just one. And we've had a surprising number of people within the kink community who go, oh, well, you're doing a ritual about Lilith. I've heard about Lilith. I might want to come to that. Even if they don't participate, you'd be surprised. There's a lot of people who want to be supportive who might go to your ritual as long as you don't say you have to say these specific prayers. Or if you'd like to show up and be a witness, we'd love to have people who show up and are respectful witnesses because you never know who's going to be the one that goes, wow, I'd never thought of that, but that calls to me. Mm -hmm. And that, that can be a moment on, on their personal path that you've helped Ex Well said. That's exactly it. That's exactly it. There's also conferences and events out there that are specifically oriented towards this kind of stuff, right? So, for example, um, especially in the pagan communities, if you look at the Dark Odyssey events, we usually have a variety of different rituals that take place. Not just we've we've actually run Buddhist prayer circles and uh, Sunday Sunday Mass and whatnot, depending on who's teaching and presenting or what attendees are there, right? And want to make magic happen, as it were. Um, there is an event that used to happen out in uh, Cleveland that every single year there was a gentleman who was a devout Christian that got crucified at the event because it was people who were willing to bear witness to his sacrifice to, to divinity, right? Um, and so people started going, oh, wow, if Christians want to bear witness to a profound act of faith and suffering to be able to connect with uh, Jesus that was Yeshua, like that is an amazing thing that people started hearing word of mouth. There are events that are specifically just for pagan kinksters, like Dark Moon Rising out in northeast, uh, out in northwest uh, Massachusetts and western Massachusetts. There is an event called Southwest Leather Conference in Phoenix, Arizona, that every year has what they call the Dance of Souls, which is 60 plus people doing hook pulls Ooh. with multiple people doing hook suspensions with a troop of kettle drummers and a group of 200 sacred witnesses that are bought body painting and or holding space all at one time. And all of them are leather and kink people, every single person in that room. Right. Mm -hmm. And so if you start tapping in, like, I'm sorry, I'm getting goosebumps talking about the dance of souls. Cause it's, in, it's into, it's very shortly from now. Ah, uh, I, I'm thinking about um, Kink Fest. They do something that's like they do something that's kind of like a smaller, like a mini version of that. And my partner, he is an atheist through and through. But even for him, having that shared spiritual experience, that shared 
emotional experience with this, with the drums and the fire dancers and people all being pulled on hooks. It's this very profound experience that I think you can enjoy to some degree, at least regardless of what your faith is or lack of faith is. It doesn't have to be an inherently pagan thing, an inherently Buddhist thing, an inherently whatever thing. Absolutely. That's why I refer to them sometimes as technologies. If I put a needle into somebody, something's going to happen, right? Whether blood comes out or tears, like it's just a technology. <laughs> it's, I, the thing that I would have an awareness about, though, is cultural appropriation and spiritual appropriation. Um, yeah. Again, this goes back to respect. For some people, it's a hot, sexy time, so who cares? That is one ethical framework. I, I, I have an awareness for myself of where am I borrowing my traditions from and giving homage where homage is due. For some people, though, showing up in full feather headdresses is just a hot, sexy outfit. And for other people, we look at it and acknowledge that people earned every single one of those feathers as part of their sacred journey within First Nations cultures in the central United mm. States. And their land has been taken and we are taking their culture as well. So it's one of those, like, where do you weigh your ethical line? And so for me, it's it's day-to-day, moment-to-moment, and do my best. So, I mean, the same thing can be argued with using words like slave, right? Like, where is the conversation around cultural yeah. framework and yeah. privilege with that whole thing? Uh, and or where's the word line around respect? Because for some people, words like appropriation and, you know, all this, it, it's a turnoff right? It's social, social justice warriors. Yeah. You want to be able to continue the conversation. Because that's not what I'm trying to do. For me, it's about having a dialogue around respect. And these are terms that have been developed in academic circles to have dialogues. But if it turns you off, let me translate accordingly. If somebody's great grandfather was actually a slave, they might have feelings. That's all we're saying. Yeah. And they're allowed to have those feelings and you're allowed to think it's hot, but you need to figure out a way for where at least one of the two of you will walk away from that experience not feeling completely awful. That comes in simple things like don't wear your giant shirt that says, uh, I'm into ropes that has a noose hanging off of it, walking into a grocery store in rural yeah. Georgia. That's rude, right? That's just rude. Yeah. Um, so to me, when I look at this with kink, there is this whole thing for me around where did various traditions come from? And it's, if it's a hook suspension, just acknowledge that for some people, that's a profoundly, that's a profound statement as a rite of passage or a profound offering of blood uh, to the name of one's gods, depending on if we're talking about uh, a tradition in, in the central United States, or if we're having a conversation about Southern India, right? Cause both of them have hook suspension uh, traditions mm-hmm. um, that are very, different when it comes to why they did them. Mm. So uh, just acknowledge where it comes from and go, okay, cool. I am using it for me, but I'm not doing it purposefully to be disrespectful. But if you are doing it purposefully to be disrespectful because you're purposefully Mm -hmm. getting off by being profane, just own it, right? That's my say. Yeah. (laughs) If people are going to call you out on your shit. So he says like, but you're defaming this baptismal pull with your piss. Go, Yep, that's what I'm doing. I'm open to a conversation or I'm not open to a conversation, but just own it, right? And know that for some people, there might be some feels. Mm -hmm. But you know what? I think some satanic porn from the 1970s is really hot. That's kind of fun. I'll do that. I'll do that scene. Does that mean I necessarily want to do those rituals? Eh, depends on the situation, right? But for a lot of people, it's a, this was just a hot thing. I'm not really mm-hmm. worshiping some dark god that I want to come down and claim my life. I just want it to be tied up in a giant pentacle and have some people drip wax and come all over me. That sounds fun. Exactly. What's, what's one person's really weird fantasy that they would never do is somebody else's Thursday night. So I think it's just about awareness, respect, love, connection, community, self-awareness. Like it's just it's that it's just that thing that's it's all the stuff that hopefully we learn in kinder, kindergarten. So really, all kink is is just uh, sharing, communication, and 
generally just being a good person and being respectful to the people around you. It's it's one of those things that's just so basic, but that in our day-to-day lives, I think we are, are so prone to forgetting. Mm, well said. I, I would warn, though, that I think it's Samuel Clemens, uh, a.k.a. Mark Twain, who said one person's heaven is another person's hell or something along those lines. Because uh, there's this notion of being mm. a good person that can be pretty tricky. Right. Because what is a good person to me might not fit exactly what you're looking for. Yeah. So I kind of look because a lot of people are like, oh, follow the golden rule. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Not everybody wants done unto them what you want done unto you. You might get off from some spanky spanky. I don't want to be spanky spanky, but thank you for the offer. So even asking people, right, if if, if fe- feathers get kerfluffled, yeah. right, feathers get riled and people feel really offended and somebody's feelings get hurt, go, wow, listen to their story. Find, instead of saying, but I didn't mean that, acknowledge that hurt, like intent isn't required for hurt to occur. Right, people's feelings can get hurt, and being willing to listen to somebody and go, "Wow, thank you for sharing your heart and your mind." Would you? Are you available for me to ask questions? What could be done in this moment for us to be able to walk away from here, both feeling like good people or both feeling well about the situation and each other? What could be done? And say whether you're available for those things or not. Also asking, are you available to know the intent of where I came from? Because not everybody wants to know. There's a, a, something I was told by, by, I think it was one of my aunts. Yeah. That was, um, anytime you say the word, but, ignore everything that came before that. Right? If somebody says, oh, I, I'm sorry, I hurt you, but. And there's a huge defense sentence after that. There's going to be a question from the person listening about whether you meant the first three words. Uh, So just pause for a second and really consider whether defending yourself in this moment is what's necessary or or listening might be the right choice. And that's really something I think goes for all practices of communication, be that polyamory, be that kink, be that vanilla interactions, be that interactions with other people in your life is just when somebody is expressing their feelings um, that they've been hurt, that they're upset about something, that something potentially bothered them in some way. There is a space and a time to just hear and just take that and understand that I, I am hearing you and not insert that. But it's really, really hard to not want to protect your ego right away and absorb the fact that somebody else is actually feeling hurt if, regardless of if that was your intention. So I think if people could learn that specifically for this situation or for other situations, just taking that time to be like, yes, I hear you. I'm listening. I'm available to understand how my actions or my words may have caused you to have this reaction. And then at some later date, Perhaps you can go into, okay, how do we prevent that from happening again and and not necessarily immediately get on the defensive because it's not necessarily a statement about you as a person. Exactly. It's not about you. So often, I mean, it's really easy to think that shit is about us. I know I fall into that, right? Where somebody says no to wanting to play with me and I'm like, I'm not cute. Nobody likes me when maybe they are waiting to go home because they've had a really crappy day or they have work tomorrow morning at 6 a.m. It's not about you. Most often, the things that come up in life really aren't about us. We weren't bad people if we go with the notions of good and bad. So acknowledge that like shit happens. Have Try to mm-hmm. communicate better. And communication isn't perfect. Keep working on it. Yeah, always, always working on that communication. I mean, uh, there, I'm sure there are plenty of great books about it, and there are many more yet to be written uh, talking about communication. Uh, one thing I did want to get to ask you before we wrap up here is special considerations around and doing play that is spiritually connective or has some sort of religious play to it, even if it's just a role play scene. It's not something you're personally invested in, particularly when it comes to aftercare, psychological and emotional aftercare. Is there anything that you've noticed um, that perhaps people should be aware of in terms of aftercare that may not necessarily be present for something like, say, an impact play scene or a rope bondage scene that is primarily about physical sensations? If I look at someone's body 
and I can see bruises rise or marks on their skin, I can see what is happening to them. My eyeballs can gauge a lot of it. Not perfectly, right? Because people are having emotions during that journey. But there's a lot of information for me available as the giver of an experience. Mm -hmm. Uh, A giver of an experience that involves a spiritual or psychological overtone involves mucking around inside the brain. I don't know every single step of someone's journey. I, I can't. Even if I've walked with them, even if I'm a sibling, right? I I don't know every single moment of everybody's history. I don't know the hot words, right? The buttons that might go off, but that are both yummy and yucky. I don't know the things that are going to come up. And so maybe it's fine for me to say, you know, that's right, boy, get down on your knees and suck this priest's cock. Okay. That might be silly and fun and hot. But if I say, um, come over here and bow before your father, Suddenly I'm hitting a different button maybe from somebody's past that sometimes they won't know until we're in the moment. People, you don't always know what you don't know until you know it. People have all kinds of wacky buttons all over them. Yeah, It's just how human beings operate. So to me, there is, if any sort of psychological play, just an awareness of that to be gentle with ourselves as well as with each other. Uh, And I bring that up because sometimes I'm the one, whether I'm a giver or a receiver of an experience or a collaborator in the case of role playing, um, where when I hit a button with myself, I'll go, oh, why didn't I communicate that ahead of time? I'm not a good communicator. You know what? Self-gentleness is really important in these situations too. All after care means is the care we need after an encounter. For some people, that means in an, in a flogging scene, that means they want the fuzzy blanket and some truffles, right? Bring your top some truffles. I love that idea. Um, that's that's what Melina Williams does. Oh yeah, right. For bring two blankets people. with you. Always bring two. <laughs> uh, Femcar, who some people will have mixed emotional responses about. She's an amazing being. She has a presence, if nothing else. Um, She does a lot of scenes and she refers to herself as a phoenix needing to be able to be reborn from the ashes. Her scenes tap into a core primal part of herself. And Mm. if anybody hands her a fuzzy blanket or tries to, quote, take care of her, it ruins the scene for her. Because her aftercare is the power to say, Um. I am a strong feminist woman who can rebuild myself from the ashes. I am not weak, no matter who has said something to me. No matter how edgy the scene was psychologically, I am here and I am strong and I am powerful. And so for some people, rebuilding from these deeply emotional and spiritual encounters, that might be what the aftercare is. Asking the people that you're with, huge, what do you think you might need? And are you open to communicating with me if those needs, wants, and desires change? Oh, that's such an important part, especially the if it changes, because you can go into a scene expecting this is a scene we've done a hundred times. I know exactly how I'm going to react. Whoa, whoa, whoa. The, the atmosphere is different. The music was different. Something you said was different. Your cologne was different, whatever it was. And suddenly there's going to be a completely different emotional response that could completely change your needs. I think that's so important to be able to say, I know this is what we've agreed to before. Are you still open to potentially changing what our arrangement is and particularly in situations where you have people and I have taken, I can't remember their name right now, but I, I've taken a couple edge play classes from somebody who their aftercare is literally, they don't want to be touched. They just want a bottle of water and that's all they need. And I think it is definitely important to recognize not everybody needs that super fluffy aftercare with the chocolates and the blankets. And other people might need to follow, have you follow up with them, or they might call you three months later and say, so you said a thing in the middle of a scene. Did you mean that? Because that's when their brain finally gets around to it, right? Because sometimes our brains percolate at different paces than we want them to. Yeah, uh, Brains are weird. Uh, so I think owning for yourself as a giver or a receiver or a collaborator, um, what you are actually available for is important too, because for some people, I am available for the next three hours to do stuff with you. And after that, you're on your own. While other people are like, call me anytime, even if it's 12 years from now. Don't don't be afraid to reach out. 
That is about self-care for the person offering that amount of thing. And I mention that because sometimes it's the giver, especially yes. in spiritual scenes, I would argue in psychological scenes in general, who afterwards oh, yeah. are like, did I just do that fucked up thing? Yeah. Did I really just draw a pentagram with somebody's blood in the middle of the forest? Was that, you know, having that cognitive dissonance about who I am as a person versus the action I have just done and maybe not even realizing it until you have a weird dream about it six months from now. Well, Master Malik talking about the the crucifixion scene, he's written about being the, the top for that, being the person who literally drove in nails into somebody's mm -hmm. body to hang them from a cross. And even though he is Sufi, even though he was raised Islamic, he still had to sit with those feelings over the next few months and sometimes even years of who am I to have just been the guy who drove nails into someone? It's what the person wanted. It was for a powerful transformative experience. I'm grateful yeah. to have been part of it, but I'm still the guy who did that. So givers, be, care, be cautious and loving with yourself too. One of my personal mantras is self-care is sexy. Self-care is and if you find yourself mm -hmm. as the person giving experience there, it's just like, oh my God, am I a good person? And your bottom or receiver isn't available for you because you did some scary ass shit to them. You were the bad guy. That, like they don't have like they don't have the ability to give you the aftercare you need. Find some peers in advance, or even just hop online and say, I am seeking positive emotional support. Anybody. And that includes that if you are the kind of person that you have no interest in sharing that part of your scared little part of yourself, because all of us carry that scared part of us. All of us have some piece of it, um, that tender spot, even if it's not about fear. Feel free to create a puppet account that has a photo of a blurry photo of your own boot, right? And create a profile that isn't lying, that's not going to go onto any profiles and, mm -hmm. you know, yuck anybody's yum, as it were. But feel free to use that puppet account to go onto a group that's about tops supporting tops and say, hey, I had a really intense scene. Does anybody have any advice? Please don't tell me I was a bad person for doing it. I don't have the emotional bandwidth for that. And say that ahead of time because there are people who might say, well, you could have done this and they mean that so lovingly. But take care of you, even in your asks, I would encourage people to. And I'm saying that from my own experience. I'm passing on my own things that I wish I'd learned from ahead of time. Yeah, being, being a top and needing aftercare and, and needing to ask for that can be so difficult because there's not really the same dialogue around it. There is for submissives. Like, that's like at least one of the first five things you learn as a bottom or an S type in general in BDSM mm -hmm. is aftercare. But we don't really talk about it for tops until much later in their development, if at all, and that they're allowed to ask for it, that they're allowed to go to other tops for support, which creates this scenario where tops don't know how to ask for it, other tops don't necessarily know how to respond to it, and it can be a lot more messy of an experience, I think, being a, a D-type or a top. Whether you identify as a giver ex of experiences or a top, a dominant, a domina, a dame, a mistress, a master, an owner, a handler, whatever's right. These are also not straight lines as a note because I know I know masochistic owners, right? Like these lines are, are wobbly. They are not straight lines of assumption. But I, I think we should really encourage ourselves, and I'm speaking because that's predominantly where I'm playing nowadays and living, uh, but not all the time, uh, is to really push that we're not allowed to, like, we deserve not just the ability to have care after our scenes, but care before our scenes and safe words and the ability to say no. Instead of having bottoms shame us into, because I've seen bottoms shame me in situations of, what do you mean you can't do that? I know you're that good. Or, oh, you mean you don't even have, you're not even like, strong enough to do that? I've had bottoms do that shit. So I would encourage tops to know that you're allowed to say no. You deserve to be able to say no. Have your own limits. Own your own desires. And check yourself once in a while and be like, wow, I'm not getting any of my needs met in this situation. Because some tops, you get your needs met by seeing the person cry or come or do whatever. That's cool. But for others of us, it's like, wait, 
I got into this because I was really into guys in tight latex. There is neither a guy nor tight latex in this scene. And check, how did I get here? And am I still in a place of yum? Is there still something out of this? Because maybe that's what you started out with. But this scene right here is delicious because I love seeing this person who I love in front of me be happy. That's now the why of you're doing this scene. Your why can shift. Just like mm. I've met people for whom that flogging was supposed to just be a flogging and suddenly they're having a transformative and or transcendental experience. The why just shifted. I didn't script it to happen, but I just had a woo thing happen, right? I just had something transformative. What the fuck was that? Give yourself permission to process, permission to have things sometimes be a little bit weird and to acknowledge that not all we're not always perfect. I might not have consented ahead of time to have a transformative experience, but sometimes shit happens. The universe sneaks in between the, the, the strokes. <laughs> yeah. So being aware as well that if this stuff sneaks up on you, or you are somebody who managed to give something to somebody that it snuck up on both of you, know that A, you can't repeat it. You cannot guarantee to do the same thing twice and B, be able to process it afterwards. So um, do you have any last thoughts that you'd like to share uh, with the audience in terms of spirituality and BDSM? I, I loved our conversation and I think talking about tops and talking about tops, you are important. What you like is important. You do have safe words. You are allowed to have safe words. You're allowed to need to have to carry. You're allowed to need all of these things. You're great. Love you. <laughs> Thank you for, for beating us who need to be beaten and, and doing the things that us bottoms and S-types yeah. love. <laughs> I think if I could walk away with a few different things, it's one is to know your intentions, right? Check your intentions. Why are you doing this thing? B or two, I don't know. I'm, I'm switching numbering systems. Mm. Uh, 2AF, drop down ampersand. No, um, I, I think I would also encourage people to give themselves cushion for being open to things, whether it's trying something new or thinking about it. Mm. If you bear witness to something, know that it's not about you, but also know that it's okay for you to change over time. Bear witness to stuff and see what grows inside of you. And if you hit one of those mm -hmm. no's, right? Like the, whoa, that's a yuck. I just hit a thing. Be, be delicate with yourself and ask for support. Also own that if it's just hot for you, rock it. And if it's something profoundly spiritual to you, if this king mm -hmm. stuff is only happening because it's part of your faith, know that that is valid too. And find ways to communicate that if you are so moved to. I do know people for whom they'll have their hot SM scenes as an act of devotion to the deity that they serve, and their top never knows. That's within their ethical lines. So again, check yourself. See if it feels okay and good to you. Um, for some people, that's not appropriate. For some people, it is. These are not solid things. They are moving targets because every single one of us is a unique little fucking flower. Every single one of us. And I love that. Mm -hmm. I think that is one of the coolest things ever. Right? I really do. That we are unique blossoms. It's, and yet oh, yeah. we have, yet we all came from the same stardust. Right? Like that's, that's pretty darn awesome. All right. Well, thank you so much for joining us today, Lee. It is definitely a pleasure to talk with you. Um, hopefully you'll be on again sometime in the future. Um, so if people wanted to find more from you and wanted to learn more about you, find your books, where is a good place to do that? My website is passionandsoul.com. You can use Passion and Soul anywhere on the internet to find my podcast, to find my Fet Life, my Facebook, like it's all out there. Or typing in Lee Harrington, you either find me or a lovely woman who wrote Rex in the City, a complete dog walking guide. She's lovely. She's gotten my fan mail. Don't do that to her. She's a lovely person, though, and I really like her. And I support her her uh, Patreon account. Um, 
Also, uh, events coming up. I'm going to be at Kinkfest in Portland, Oregon, teaching, which I'm incredibly excited about. I'm going to be uh, doing a mini tour right after that in Seattle, San Francisco, and Portland. And you can stay to uh, uh, San Francisco, Seattle, sorry, Seattle, San Francisco, and uh, Ventura, California. So you can see that on, on my website on upcoming appearances. I already know that I'm going to be at Camp Crucible. Mm-hmm. And Dark Odyssey, both Dark Odyssey Winter Fire in the D.C. area and Dark Odyssey Fusion in Northern Maryland. For people who want to tune in ahead of time and build, plan up for next November, I'm also going to be at the Kink Social Cruise, which is going to be heading out of Miami. And we're going to spend nine days hanging out with other kinksters on a giant floating munch with classes and just getting to know and have great friends with each other. So that's the other thing I have coming up. But yeah, in general, find my website. I teach, I talk. I've been blogging since 1998, back when we called them internet journals. So feel free. Feel free to stalk me. And I have a little section at the bottom of my website that says stalking made easy <laughs> for exactly that. Oh, awesome. All right. Well, thank you so much for sharing. i um, very much looking forward to seeing you at Kingfest. I will be there as well. So I'm sure I will be going to as many of your classes as possible. Yeah. Um, and obviously... Evie Lupine, you guys know where to find me. You're on my channel. Um, link to all of the stuff that Lee Harrington just mentioned will be down in the description box below if you want to check that out. Links in the doobly-doo sidebar. Other places will also be available. And uh, be sure as well to check back again, guys, in a couple of weeks as we continue this interview series. Once again, thank you so much, Lee, for being on. And have a great night, everybody. <laughs>